I would say the the main uh, allure that uh, data science has uh, over conducting empirical research in an academic environment, uh, uh, you are forced to operate at a much higher speed, uh, but you actually get to implement the solutions that you find. Hi, my name is Hevi Chan Zhang. I'm a data scientist at Recurly and a project lead at TowardsDataScience.com. Today I have with me Dr. Guido Moretto, who is a former associate professor of business strategy at the Nova School of Business and Economics. He's currently a data scientist at Flyer Labs in San Francisco. I'm very excited to have him on today, so thanks for joining Dr. Guido. Thank you for having me, Hebi Chan. How are you? Good, man. How's everything in San Francisco? Well, things are good. It's a summer, though, so it's foggy. But other than that, we can't complain, right? Yeah, that's San Francisco for you. So, you know, first, I wanted to establish your name first. What's the best way for me to address you as? Is it Dr. Moreto, Professor Guido? Guido. OK, great. With that established, I also wanted to get your background uh, straight as well. So you received your PhD from Caltech. And then you moved on and became a professor for about seven years. Am I getting that correct? Uh, yeah. So first I was a postdoc in uh, Brussels, in Belgium. And uh, then I started a faculty position in Lisbon, in Portugal, where I stayed until I moved to industry. I see. Oh, what were your main responsibilities at the Nova School? Oh, well, I was teaching and doing research. Um, Initially, my research was mostly uh, mathematical theoretical models. Uh, then uh, I got more interested uh, in uh, empirical analysis, so using data. And specifically, the reason is that uh, with a colleague in Bra Brussels, uh, now is at the Bank of England, we got um, curious about things that government was saying about criminal organizations in Italy. And different politicians were saying opposing uh, uh, state making opposing statements. So we decided that it would be worth uh, to get to the numbers to answer the question of who was lying, basically, and uncover some truth. So that's how I ended up doing empirical research, and uh, um, and that eventually uh, got me interested in working in industry because when you work in academia, you have a lot of time to answer questions very precisely uh, with good methodology. Uh, so having a chance of getting true answers better, the best possible methods. But unfortunately, the impact is very low because even if you spot the root cause of a problem, find a potentially good solution, test it in some way, um, before uh, any policymaker picks up uh, uh, the solution or the analysis or something with it, it may be years. Uh, this is more true, I guess, where I'm from, which is Southern Europe. Mm, I see. Uh, so this is what got me interested in moving to industry, the possibility of solving problems, but not just finding potential solutions, actually implementing the solutions. Was that the main reason for moving from academia to industry? Uh, absolutely. I would say the, the main uh, allure that uh, data science has uh, over conducting empirical research in an academic environment uh, uh, you are forced to operate at a much higher speed, uh, but you actually get to implement the solutions that you find. How did you manage that transition from academia to, to data science? I uh, strengthened a bit my skills going to a coding bootcamp, uh, which was very important because the type of uh, machinery that uh, we use, both in terms of statistical methods, but most importantly in terms of statistical packages, that are used uh, conducting uh, uh, economic research are not the same that are used uh, uh, are used in industry. Even though the goal may still to do optimal pricing, uh, estimate demands, and, and whatnot, uh, the type of volume of data that uh, is used uh, and the current state of the art of the industry require the use of a different set of tools. Oh, I see. So what were some of the uh, important differences between the tools that you've used as a past as an academic and the tools that you're using now as a data scientist? Uh, something quite important that is different from uh, academia. Uh, economists are mostly trained on Stata. These days, uh, R is becoming, uh, uh, luckily, more common in the curriculum, but uh, in uh, most uh, data science is probably done in uh, Python with a majority and a bit of R. Uh, but there is this skill gap, skill gap that is necessary to bridge. Also, no academic, no SQL. 
and uh, anyone who has uh, uh, worked in data science knows that it's pretty hard to escape entirely from uh, from SQL. Okay, so it seems like you were able to transition pretty well into the new profession. Uh, how long have you been a data scientist by now? So I've been a data scientist for uh, a year. No, a bit less than a year, I guess. I see. Uh, you know, I think that's a good amount of time to get exposed to the life of a data scientist. Uh, so I'm curious, what's the similarities and the differences that you find in the types of problems that you've solved in the past as an academic and the problems that you're solving now? In terms uh, of uh, the subject of study, there is no difference. I uh, now I work uh, in a company that helps uh, some uh, major airlines uh, uh, sign prices to the seas, and so what I do entails demand estimation, uh, competitive analysis uh, of different markets, uh, and creating automated models uh, that can react to the situation and giving our customers the uh, best possible prices. So. In terms of what I think about uh, day in, day out, there's very little difference, actually. In terms of how I think about the organization of the work, there is a world of difference. Everything is faster, and uh, everything is also shallower by, by its nature. Uh, but this is the way it, it, uh, it has to be, because there's a, there's a trade-off between finding a you know, great solution and doing something in the meantime. This is a trade off that does not really exist in academia, but of course, it's fundamental to the life of a corporation to be able to keep operating while the biggest improvements are, uh, are achieved. You know, it's, it's really interesting that you say when it comes to the subject and the problems that you're solving, the like demand estimation or pricing analysis, you know, there's little difference between data science and economics. Uh, but when it comes to the broader disciplinary approaches to solving these problems, like demand estimation, uh, do you see any big overlaps there as well? Yes. So um, specifically in the case uh, of uh, economics, but of most sciences that uh, use data, the focus is not on forecasting something that will happen, but on explaining why something happens. So to be a bit more precise, if we want, is that what we do in data science is out of forecasting. And what we do in uh, academic research is a lot of inference. Uh, now, never mind uh, that 80% uh, of social science research outside of economics doesn't even understand the difference between causality and correlation, but you know, that's their own problem. Uh, but in reality, so the biggest methodological difference is that, is that uh, hanging your head uh, on whether a relation is causal or, or uh, or not uh, is important only in so far as it helps with prediction, which is certainly the case uh, for when what we want to predict is demand, because uh, that's a problem that suffers for uh, a lot of endogeneity biases of various kinds. But in other cases, uh, uh, the methods are extremely different, uh, and uh, some problems will lend themselves to the use uh, of uh, highly nonlinear and completely non-transparent methods that you know that lack. Uh, uh, interpretability of the relations that are built inside the model, but they're very effective at forecasting. Hi, everybody. For clarification, Guido argues that certain problems do very well with neural networks and other data science methods. Comparatively, other problems like price setting through demand estimation are more suited for inference-based methods that are simpler but yield more accurate returns. Endogeneity in pricing is a specific example of this. In the case of price setting, one important endogenous variable is the consumer's willingness to pay on the prices that are set. And this variable is unobserved, not included in our model, and not independent from price. To learn more about the specifics of endogeneity, please refer to this TDS article on the subject. You know, that's very interesting. Uh, you point to these big methodological differences. You know, uh, the two different methods that you mentioned are one, this causal analysis, and the other, which is this nonlinear pattern recognition that lacks model interpretability. So from your personal experiences, um, how are these two very different paradigms played out in daily practice? Uh, in practice, uh, there is a bit of both, because if, if you throw a deep neural network, uh, 
at uh, uh, at the man data, and then you are you start setting the prices, which is what most companies that uh, do pricing and use uh, uh, machine learning models for demand estimation do. Then you will find that the model will fail because the process that generates the prices has changed; it has become new. The reason for this, again, has to do with indigeneity. Here, models are trained on data in which prices are not independent from the endogenous variable, the customer's willingness to pay. So once these models go live in production, these models will change the process generating the prices and its covariance with the endogenous variable. As a result, the predictions based on the original training set will become less precise. So it's, uh, there's a bit of an art uh, in uh, using uh, methods that are very powerful that are, allow us to achieve higher accuracy, but are not interpretable. So in practice, what, we, what I see in my day-to-day -to work, which involves demand estimation, is that we have to do uh, a bit of both, practically speaking. So there's definitely a steering away from the search for causality that is typical of academic research in economics but it cannot it cannot be uh, completely dropped uh, because the same tools that are used uh, to sharpen causal analysis uh, are powerful uh, in feature selection for for customers. what are some of the common data science tools and techniques that you get to use at flyer labs oh yeah so um flyer the company where I work is a python workshop so we do everything uh, in in Python. In terms of which packages we use, uh, uh, there is a it's a we're a small company, so there's still a, we still have a freedom to pick and choose uh, without being tied uh, to the to a specific package. I personally like because of my economic background, I enjoy uh, doing my initial analysis with stats models because I find it is the package that offers the most. Uh, um, complete uh, and easy to use set of tools for inference. Uh, for example, it allows me to cluster errors very easily, which is very complicated with scikit-learn, for example. Uh, then in some cases, you know, for deploying to production, we would move to scikit-learn or TensorFlow to use uh, uh, some other features that, that's, I would say, I have to say, Stats Models is not too great for production. Anymore. What are some of the more bigger challenges that you get to face in your day-to-day -day responsibilities? Uh, um, in absolute or uh, in comparison to the to academia? In absolute terms. In absolute terms. Uh, um, I would say that uh, the one thing that is always a challenge, maybe, maybe not so much for me because I was used to teaching in a business school and so speaking to a non-technical audience, is... Um, the need uh, to get buy-in uh, for uh, one solution at different levels, and sometimes politicking gets in the way of uh, of that. So that's a bit, uh, I would say, the the most complicated, uh, the most difficult part. Because I, by character, I don't like to talk a lot and re repeating the same things over and over. So I have convinced one person that a solution is good. Uh, I'm not excited about convincing person number two, and so on and so forth. So I would say that uh, uh, this is, however, a fundamental aspect uh, in a career of a data scientist because without this uh, self-promotion, let's say, or promotion of your solution, you will not get them implemented and you will not get impact uh, on your company's metrics. And this is going to ultimately limit your career, of course. So I think it's a necessary uh, evil. And then to some, to some people, it's, uh, it can be very enjoyable. I mean, many people enter data science and then they go into product uh, because they have a preference for the soft side uh, uh, of, the, of the job, let's say, rather than the actual uh, uh, analysis and producing facts, uh, et cetera. See, thank you very much. Um, as a final question, uh, are there any words of wisdom that you can share to the TDS community, especially for those who are in academia or economics who want to enter data science? Uh, do you have any words of wisdom for them? Um, 
Well, especially to people, I'm a bit old, I'm 41, right? Uh, and uh, what is happening these days is that the number of uh, PhD fellowships is not decreasing, but uh, it's increasing, if anything. And the number of faculty positions and pure research positions in universities is decreasing. So by all means, uh, uh, keep an eye out uh, and consider industry an opportunity and data science an opportunity to, to transition to uh, in your uh, throughout your, your, your career. If I had, uh, if there was uh, the same amount uh, and availability and visibility for jobs, uh, data science type of jobs as there is today when I finished grad school, I don't know if I would, would have even gone to academia. Maybe I would, but for a short period of time. And so I would, uh, um, yeah, I would say that, uh, remember that the academic job market uh, is uh, only getting harder and you still can uh, solve interesting problems. Uh, and actually, not just solve, you can find solutions to interesting problems and see those solutions put to work uh, if you work in the private sector as opposed to just in the sector. Great, thank you very much. I think that's all the time that we have for today. So thank you again for joining Guido. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.